As you know, we often talk on this show about political revolutions, but tonight we'll meet someone who's at the forefront of a revolution that's much more personal, a revolution in the way people think and the way they behave. Far-left Democrats appear to be weaponizing political correctness against President Trump to gain political leverage. However, some say the PC pandemic poses a far greater challenge. And when I began my tenure as Surgeon General, if you had told me that I would be thinking about and talking about loneliness as much as I have, uh, I would have told you you're absolutely wrong. But it's hard not to notice that the incidence of Americans, the number of Americans on psychiatric medication is rising, but so is the suicide rate. What do you make of that? Now, if you're one of the few people who still hasn't heard of Dr. Peterson, his meteoric rise to fame has brought him to the forefront of the world of psychology, with his message influencing millions of people around the world. In fact, Dr. Peterson has been described as the most influential public intellectual in the Western world right now. There's this, this is the deepest idea of mankind. It's developed in detail in Genesis in the Old Testament. It's the fundamental idea of Genesis that God uses the Logos, the Word of God, to cast potential. You know that the future is unstructured. You have a, you have a potential within you that can meet that, and there's a potential that characterizes the future. You meet it with eyes open and with truthful speech. And that's what happens in Genesis, because God uses the Logos, which is truthful speech, to cast the pre-cosmogonic potential into habitable order. And then he says it's good. And now there's a hint there, right? Because you think, well, is habitable order good? Because life is very difficult. And it's a real question whether or not the order that we inhabit is good. And the hypothesis in the Old Testament is that if truthful speech gives rise to the order, then that order will be good. And that's really something, man. Like, that's really something to apprehend. It's a fundamental theological presupposition that the way that you take the potential upon which the cosmos is predicated and cast it into the order that allows everyone to thrive is by using truthful speech. Wouldn't it be something if that was the case? And the thing is, you know it's the case. You know it. You know it. Because you do not admire yourself if you're deceitful. You admire yourself when you have those rare moments in your life where you can actually stand up and say what's true, regardless of the cost. And if you, if you give that respect to other people, if you treat them as if they're the locale of the divine speech that casts potential into habitable order, then they like you. Maybe they even love you and they get along with you and you can work with them and you can cooperate with them and you can compete with them. So not only is it the, the fundamental axiom that regulates your relationship with yourself, it's the fundamental axiom that regulates your interactions with other people. And if you do not give them that, that honor, which is the, the presupposition for their natural right, right? Because you're, the idea that you have a natural right is the idea that you have some sort of intrinsic value. If you don't pe treat people as if they have that intrinsic right, they are not happy with you, even if they don't know why. Because everyone wants to be treated as if they have free will and as if they confront potential and as if they're capable of making moral choices and that they should be rewarded when they do things right and perhaps punished when they do things wrong. Everyone wants that and everyone knows it. And so, well, so what does that all have to do with free speech? Well, everything. yes, everything. That's exactly right. So. This is a country that in continues to oppress communities of color, LGBTQIA communities, Muslims, and those they deem to be the other. Advocates of political correctness claim the main goal of PC is to protect the vulnerable and oppressed by promoting inclusiveness, diversity and multiculturalism. But in reality, some have said PC has taken heavy toll on First Amendment rights, claiming it has crippled the language, topics of discussion and decision-making in America's social and political life. Ever since the 1990s, the ideas of social justice, fairness and redistribution of wealth have become a new normality in America's public discourse. In such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. The globalist left appears to be using PC narratives in order to reach out to as many demographic groups they can, including Muslims, women and LGBT communities, in order to boost its influence in the society. You know, people think of free speech as 
kind of like a decoration, something like that in your life. And it's not that at all. It's not the ability to speak truth to power, although it is also that. It's not that. It's way more than that. Free speech is how you think. It's not thinking, you know, the, the word that, that, that Genesis relies on to create the cosmos, let's say, in the story. By the way, that's the image of God in which you're made, male and female, that gives you that fundamental value that's at the core of our idea of natural right. It's not thinking, it's speaking. And the reason for that is, look, first of all, you can hardly think. It's really hard to think. You have to be trained like mad to think. You have to be able to divide yourself internally into a couple of different people. And then you have to let those people have a war in your head. And that means you have to develop characters who have opinions in great detail, opinions that might be contrary to your own. And then you have to withstand the tension of letting them have it out. And you know, you can think a little bit, but mostly you're biased and you have confirmation bias and you see things the way you see them and you have massive blind spots and you're ignorant as hell. You just, you just, you just can't think, but you can talk. And the thing is, if you talk, other people will correct you. That's the thing. And that's thinking. So if you get up and you have some th something to say, and you say it stupidly, because of course you will, because what do you know, then other people will tell you where you're wrong. And then you can learn, right? And then everybody can think. And so what that also means is that to be free to speak, even to tell the truth, means you have to be free to be stupid and ignorant and malevolent and bitter. Because that is who you are. That is what you are, because you're flawed. So the idea that, you know, you, you can't use your free speech if it's offensive is just, it's an idea that is so, ab you don't know if it's naivety outdoes its malevolence. It's a real battle. Which of the which of those two things are worse? I would go with malevolence because it detracts, it attacks something that's so absolutely fundamental. Political correctness was designed by far-left ideologists of the past century to advance a global proletarian revolution which would lead the mankind from capitalist injustices through socialist reforms toward a bright future. And in the Stalinist Soviet Union, political correctness became a tool of political repressions, populating the labor camps of Gulag with tens of millions of those who disagree with the general line of the party. The US imported the concept of political correctness in the 1970s when left-wing intellectuals, including then-graduate student Hillary Clinton, embraced the idea of putting equality above liberty. And it's hardly surprising, as some believe PC became the dominant public narrative during the presidency of her husband, Bill Clinton. And we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist Leninism. And they will see in future what the what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice. Obviously they will revolt. They, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. All this suggests PC reaches far beyond public conversations, inflicting deep and irreversible division and hostility within Western societies. Whether this new globalist project eventually comes into life remains to be seen. We know that there's something about free speech that's so central that we cannot allow attacks on it to go unchallenged no matter where they occur. But it's very useful to have it articulated and to know that this is bedrock, right? And it's not something arbitrary, and it's not a mere game, a mere game that we're only playing in the West. None of that. It's something, it's the most fundamental truth that the human race has ever discovered. And we, we lose it at our absolute peril. And it's not death, it's worse than that, the peril. Because there are worse things than death. And the worst thing than death is hell. And we saw plenty of that in the 20th century. And when we let freedom of speech go, that's where we're headed. And unless we want to go there, then we should stop aiming for it. Most of our dialogue in the mainstream media, I would say, is mm -hmm. always focused on political issues. And so if you have a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Right. But it's also the case that part of what brought me to wider public attention was my opposition to some legislation in Canada, mm -hmm. a bill called C-16, which I regarded as an attempt on the government's part to compel speech. But in private speech, there's to be no compulsion from the government. It's different than forbidding you to say certain things because this was a requirement for a certain form of speech. And that emerged in this bill, C-16, which purported to extend, to do nothing but extend certain rights 
to um, the transgender community in Canada, but which was, in my estimation, and I read the policies very carefully, an attempt to write a particular view of gender into the law, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the view that gender is only a consequence of environmental conditions, is socially constructed, which is patently false and runs contrary to what I would regard as thoroughly settled science and also to compel a certain form of address. And mm -hmm. I felt that that meant that the politicians in Canada were using a false compassion and, mm -hmm. and a certain ideological attitude to justify extending dominion over the content of free people's speech. The enemies of free speech, they're the enemies of the process that turns potential into habitable order. They're enemies of the divine principle. And worse, they're their own enemies, right? Because this isn't, well, some of us believe in free speech and some of us don't. It's way deeper than that. And, and more importantly than that, that's how our entire society views you. The reason that individual sovereignty inheres in you, why you have the rights of a citizen and why you're, you're regarded as a sovereign individual is because our entire culture over thousands of years has actually decided that there's something in you of ultimate value that the entire stability of the entire society depends on, that you could bring forward and nurture and that the world would definitely be a lesser place without. That's way better than you're okay the way you are. Right, I think, I think people agree with that. If you don't believe in free speech, you don't believe in the implicit divinity of mankind, you don't believe in the sovereignty of the individual, you don't believe in sovereignty as such, you're a totalitarian of some sort, which means you attribute all the divine power to yourself. It's, and then we know where that leads, right? It doesn't matter whether it's on the right or the left. If we had any sense and we took a look at 20th century history, we know exactly where things go and we could easily choose not to go there. And so when we see someone like Raif, who's imprisoned by a reprehensible dictatorship that we have the gall to call our allies, then what we see is a, a, a system that's not only hell-bent on the destruction of an innocent and good man, but, but directly antithetical to everything that all of us have and that our societies put forward as necessary to the continual betterment of being itself. And so, <laughs> no, and I've been so absolutely appalled by the Western world's weak need response to the attacks of totalitarians upon our freedom of speech. Like the, what was done with Salman Rushdie, that was a big, 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 big mistake, right? Because it wasn't Rushdie, it was the free-speaking artistic tradition of the West. And not only of the West, right? The free-speaking artistic creative tradition upon which the cosmos is properly established. That's what it was. And we all bowed down. We all bowed down with no resistance whatsoever. It was a massive error. We're going to pay for that for a very long time. We did the same thing with the Danish cartoons. And you don't want to think about these sorts of things as happening far away. Nothing happens far away. When it happens somewhere else, it's happening right here too. And that's why we're all here today, because we recognize that at least on some level. And we have to stop. We need to stop being so naive about our, let's say, our moral relativism. We need to take a look at history and biology in a very, very fundamental way. And we need to really understand what our culture, what our culture and, and genuine cultures everywhere are predicated on. And that is the idea that the sovereign voice of the individual is the power that casts potential into habitable being and restructures tyrannical order when it needs to be restructured, right? And that's what each of us are. That's the divine presence in each of us. And I do believe that there is no more fundamental truth than that. I, I don't believe that you can dig down underneath that. I think that's bedrock. That's the foundation stone of the house. That's the cornerstone of the house. And it requires everyone to courageously confront the tyranny that's them and the unknown that surrounds them and to live with true speech as the highest value. That's how we sort out the world. And I do believe that it's incumbent on us to understand the absolutely fundamental role that these processes take. I know we're here today because we all have at least an intimation of that, right? We know that there's something about free speech that's so central that we cannot allow attacks on it to go unchallenged no matter where they occur. Dr. Peterson, it's a I'm pleasure to, to see you today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Peterson, reading you and, and hearing you on YouTube, what have you, I, it seems to be clearly, you clearly have an issue with ideologues on both the extreme left and the extreme right. Mm -hmm. What I call the, the twin cobras or mm -hmm. the matter and antimatter of our political discourse. 
So you wrote in your book that we are, uh, our minds are deeply social. And so with that question as a, as a social scientist, are we uh, nurtured um, to the views that we have grown to have, or are we somehow um, hardwired by, by nature to some degree to, to have a tendency toward one way of thinking oh, or the other? Mm -hmm. and, and if we are, if you started to agree with that, yeah. if we are predisposed to have some sort of leaning one way or the other, then are we not doomed to a sense of zero-sum warfare for political power, um, no, winners and losers question. like your good friendly question. lobsters? Okay, so, uh, so the first thing I would say is we, we, we are tilted by our biological temperament in, in terms of our political viewpoint. So we know, for example, that conservative people tend to be higher in conscientiousness, a big five personality trait, especially in the orderliness element of that trait. And so, and they tend to be lower in another trait, openness. And openness is broadly speaking the creativity trait. And so, whereas liberals are high in openness, but low in orderliness. And th there is very powerful biological tilting towards those temperamental predispositions. Now, they can be moved by experience, but it's as if you have a set point and then you have to strive to move from that set point. Okay, so, and, and then of course, you, your viewpoints can be modified by your experience and your, and your wisdom, all of that. But you have to start out with a set of filters on the world because the world is too complicated. And so you have to, f you, you, your, your mind, your brain, your psyche filters things for you and then presents a certain world to you. So because you can't read all the facts and some facts jump out at you and others don't. And that's partly a consequence of your temperament. Okay, so that's not necessarily a bad thing because there are different niches for people of different temperaments. So, for example, introverts are good at such things as accounting. They're more because they can work alone, whereas extroverts are better at things like sales. And so there's a place for people on both ends of the temperamental distribution. So you need people who are wild experimenters in thinking and those who are more conservative. Like if you want to hone the way you think, you need opposition. You need something pushing against you. But what, what has to happen, and this is rule nine, is you have to assume that the person that you're listening to, that you're talking with, knows something you don't. And so you, you, we can engage in a dialogue between left and right. The right tends to stand for hierarchy and, and to value hierarchies as tools for obtaining necessary goals. And the left tends to view hierarchies as characterized by the proclivity to dispossess and to become mm. tyrannical. Mm. Those are both correct. Through the dialogue, we can keep the hierarchies functional. Now, because you, you might think, well, th there's, there's no shortage of ways to live in the world. And that's a moral, morally relativistic stance. And there's something to that, obviously, because people differ, and people differ in occupations, and they differ in outlook, and, and so forth. They differ, differ in political beliefs. So there's obviously many ways that we can thrive in the world. And so some degree of flexibility with regards to what constitutes your fundamental axioms, obviously, is, is necessary. Um, but there's a deeper question, and, and, and this is a very deep question. I actually think it's, a, it's the question at the bottom of the postmodern conundrum, which is whether or not there are any um, reliable meta-narratives, let's say, overarching narratives that can unite people in some fundamental way. And so I was curious, were, were these just two arbitrary ways of looking at the world, both potentially equally valid? And were we battling that out because we didn't know and there was no other way to battle it out? Or was there something deeper at stake? Was it possible that one or the other system was correct in some deep manner? And so I started to study deeply this, this particular question. The first question was, well, what were beliefs made out of? Like, what exactly is it? What are, what are we talking about when we talk about a belief? What does it mean that you have beliefs? Well, how are beliefs structured? You know, so that was a psychological question rather than a political or economic question. And that took me a long time to figure out because I didn't know if the fundamental question was going to be sociological or political or, or economic or psychological. And it turned out to be psychological or perhaps it turned out to be spiritual. That's another way of thinking about it.